this web lecture, we're going to start to think about the three extant lineages of mammals. These include the monotremes, which include the platypus and also the spiny echidna, these egg-laying mammals native to Australia and New Zealand. The second lineage is the marsupials, which include kangaroos and also most of the rest of the mammalian diversity in Australia. And then the third lineage is the placental mammals, or the eutheria, which includes most of the mammals that you know, so the mammalian diversity uh, pretty much throughout the rest of the world outside of Australia. So first let's take a look at how these groups of mammals fit into the rest of amniotes and also how they are related to each other. So again, we're going to think about this tree in terms of dichotomous splitting, so a split of one lineage into two lineages. So let's start down here with the amniotes, the split between synapsids and sauropsids, so all of the uh, reptiles and birds and dinosaurs are over here on the sauropsid side, and then the mammals, we're only looking now at the extant mammals here on the synapsid side of this split. So our first dichotomous split within the mammals are between the monotremes on one side and the marsupials, also known as the metatheria, and the placentals, so the clade that includes both of those. So we can say that marsupials and placentals are more closely related to each other than either of them are to the monotremes. And if you remember from the last web lecture, monotremes are actually a very early diverging group from the rest of the mammals. The marsupials and eutherians diverged much later in evolutionary history. So these three living lineages of mammals are distinguished primarily based on their different reproductive strategies. So let's take a look at that. Let's first look at monotremes. So let's think about what were the evolutionary changes that occurred going from monotremes um, toward primates, who have a very different reproductive strategy. So first of all, it's going to involve separation of the openings from the body of the digestive, urinary, and reproductive tracts. So in monotremes and also in all other tetrapods, there is a single opening called the cloaca that is the exit for digestive waste. So this is the gut tube coming down um, from behind. Metabolic waste from the kidneys, so these are the ureters coming in and joining up with the bladder, which is going to be storing urine, and then it's coming out, joining up with that gut tube and coming out through the same exit. And also for the reproductive tract. So here are the ovary and the uterus coming down and also depositing right into this cloaca. Um, the name monotreme actually translates as single hole, and so that refers to the single opening, the cloaca, for all of these functions. So monotremes have a cloaca, all three exits combined. So this was a bit of a conundrum when the monotremes were first discovered uh, because they're reproductive system is so different from other mammals that are known. So one of the activities you're going to be doing, and I want you to think about a little bit ahead of time um, in class on Wednesday, is to compare these drawings of the urogenital systems of the platypus with the kangaroos on the one hand with birds. So the bird, birds were the natural comparison because of the um, beak that was found on the duck-billed platypus and also because they were um, egg-laying, people tended to compare them to birds. So this is something that you're going to be thinking about in class on Wednesday, uh, making detailed comparisons between these drawings. The egg has a relatively large yolk and it's nourished in the uterus uh, by that yolk and the embryo grows actually to quite a great extent before the egg is laid. The offspring hatch in a very uh, early stage of development. We call this having an altricial young. So care and brooding by the mother continues. The mother's going to continue to keep that hatchling warm and feed it milk using mammary glands that actually do not have any kind of nipple or teat associated with them. The 
Mother secretes the milk directly onto the fur, and then the young just suck the milk off of the fur. In marsupials, we start to see the separation of these exits from the body. And the first separation is of the rectum, uh, removing digestive waste, and what we call the urogenital sinus. So the young are still going to emerge from the same exit that carries urine away from the body but now the digestive waste is separated out. We also see in marsupials paired lateral vaginae, so two vaginae um, around the outside, and they are going to carry sperm into the uterus, so there's a separate cervix for each uterus. And then when the joeys are born, the baby marsupial is going to come down through the central canal, which we call the pseudovaginal canal, and then out through this urogenital opening. To look at this in a slightly different view, here we see the kidneys and the ureters coming down behind the uteruses, looping through in between these lateral vaginae, um, coming into the bladder, which is placed anteriorly in front of the reproductive organs, and then the two lateral vaginae, and then the central birth canal where the joeys will be born. So corresponding to these paired lateral vaginae, we see also in the male uh, marsupials what we call a bifid or forked penis. So each one of these two branches of the penis will go into one of those two lateral vaginae and deposit sperm to be carried up to the uterus. Marsupials are born at a very, very early stage of development. We can see in this illustration the two things that are very well developed in a newborn marsupial joey are the forelimbs and the mouth. And this sort of makes sense because this tiny little underdeveloped newborn joey has to basically crawl and climb from the birth canal into the marsupium or the pouch where it's going to attach to a nipple to continue its development. So it needs these highly well-developed front limbs to be able to make that journey and also its mouth needs to be very very well developed to be able to attach to the nipple and suckle. And so, so here you see a picture of a newborn baby koala um, basically looks like a fetus with four limbs and a mouth and then it finishes its development in the pouch and also in close association with its mother after it's well enough developed to only need to return to the pouch just for um, nursing and taking in milk. So now let's take a look at reproduction in the eutherian mammals or the placental mammals. So obviously the big change that happens here is the further development of the placenta, so the structure that allows nutrients and oxygen and uh, waste materials to be exchanged between the mother and the growing embryo. Placental mammals have only a single vagina. The double vagina was uh, a derived feature in the marsupials. And when we get to primates, we see that they have just a single uterus, and they also separate the reproductive and urinary tracts. So here we see in non-primate placental mammals, uh, there's a separate opening for the rectum, but still a common opening for the urinary and reproductive systems. In primates, we have a completely separate opening for the urethra, carrying materials from the bladder, the birth canal, uh, the uterus and vagina, and then the rectum. In marsupials, we see a version of a placenta, what we call a choriovitelin placenta. So it's made up of the chorion, Remember, that's one of the four extra embryonic or fetal membranes, and the yolk sac. So choriovitelin refers to the chorion and the yolk sac. But in placental mammals, we call it a choriolentoic placenta, but it's actually derived from all four of the extra embryonic fetal membranes. So this close association between the blood supply of the fetus and the mother allows a longer gestation period so that the young are born much, much, much more developed um, than they are in the marsupial. So let's take a look at how this placenta forms. So this is a lot of information. Don't worry about the details. Just listen to the details that I'm pointing out. 
So very early in mammalian development, the embryo begins to form. There's a small yolk sac underneath, and this amniotic sac actually develops very early in mammalian development. And this amniotic sac and the yolk sac are sort of pressed together. Imagine sort of pressing two balloons together, and there's this flat surface in between them. This flat surface in between is the actual developing body of the embryo. So these are these two layers that begin the development. And again, you can see here is the embryo developing between the yolk sac and the amniotic sac. But we're beginning to see also this chorion forming around the whole outside of it. Uh, as in all other amniotes, the chorion is highly, highly vascularized. You can see the blood supply starting to sort of grow out into the wall of the uterus. Uh, mammals undergo gastrulation, so the formation of the three embryonic germ layers um, as this sort of flat disc sandwiched between these two sacs. And so here we see the mesoderm beginning to form between an ectoderm and an endoderm. So this is the stage we call the trilaminar disc. So the chorion is continuing to form these little outgrowths into the wall of the uterus. The uterus is also forming these ingrowths of the maternal blood supply, kind of interdigitating with the, these outgrowths of the fetal blood supply. So a combination of the yolk sac and the allantois is going to form these, this umbilical cord that's going to make the attachment with the placenta. Remember when you saw the yolk sac and the allantois in non-mammalian amniotes, it was a supply of nutrients into the foregut and then the exit of the uh, waste products out of the hindgut. Um, these two are going to, these two functions are going to remain in the umbilical cord, bringing nutrients into the foregut, bringing waste out of the hindgut, but this time exchanging that with the maternal blood rather than from the yolk and into sort of a separate allantoic sac. Among placental mammals, there is still quite a lot of diversity uh, among the forms of these uh, different reproductive organs. So uh, we can have anything from what we call a duplex uterus, which is two completely separated uh, uteruses, each with its own cervix. You can see the, um, the little muscular opening between the uterus and uh, each uterus and the vagina. Um, having a slightly altered version of this with a single cervix and two horns of the uterus. This is very common in cats and dogs, most carnivores, pigs, whales, and then of course a common vagina. To a bicornate uterus in which there's a single uterus but each uterus has its own sort of little separate horns and so most ungulates have this form of uterus, uh, manatee, insectivores, most bats. Um, early primates and the pangolin, and then in more derived primates and some bats, and then some random groups, anteaters and tree sloths, we see what we call a simplex uterus, where there's one single uterus with fallopian tubes leading to the ovaries and uh, leading to a single birth canal through the vagina. So thinking about this diversity, on Wednesday I'm going to have you Continue on with this exercise considering more of the placental mammals in your comparison. So we're going to go on to compare and contrast the kangaroo with the placentals in the bottom row. Uh, looking at evolutionary trends, focusing on paired and unpaired structures, but also the relationship between urinary and reproductive openings. So be thinking about that for one of your activities on Wednesday.